Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study today. Thank you, Lord, because you bring us together so that the teaching of your word can enlighten us. The teaching of your word can edify us so that the teaching of your word will do something in our lives that our neighbors will see the light of the gospel. Lord, you are not the author of confusion. You are the author of peace in your house. Therefore, Lord, we pray that there will be orderliness, there will be peace in your house in Jesus' name. Open the pages of the scriptures to us. Give us this bread of life. Help us, Lord, that we we'll receive what you are teaching us. Give us the grace to be obedient. That we will not come in here and disturb the study. Because that shows dishonor unto you. But we'll come in as people that want to learn. And as we learn, this word will empower us to please you at all times, in all places, in Jesus' name. Teach us today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we continue with our study. We're in the book of Prophet Joel. We started this uh, Monday some weeks ago. And today we're looking at Joel chapter 2. Already we have studied from verse 1 all through to verse 11. And if you were here with us, when we looked at those verses, Joel was bringing a message from the Lord. And he was talking about the terrors of judgment. And the judgment of God, it wasn't given to threaten them or even to destroy them. It was given so that the people of God, the whole nation, will come to repentance. Many people do not understand the reason for the judgment of God, for the rebuke of God. God's judgment or chastisement is actually calling us to repentance. And that's always his purpose, and that's still his purpose in our lives today. We're told in Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26, reading there from verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when, listen to this, when, take note of it, when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. That's the purpose, that's the reason. Let favor be showed to the wicked. Yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. The Lord makes it very clear. It's not of his love. He tells us in another place, in Proverbs as well as in Hebrews, that whom the Lord loveth, he chastises and rebukes every son whom he receives. So that's the reason why Joel was used of God to bring uh, the terrors, the announcement of the terrors of judgment to the people of Judah. And he was calling them to repentance. And was telling them all the people they should grieve inwardly and they should mourn outwardly for their sins they were not merely to just regret because of the painful consequences of their sins but they were to feel the deep sorrow of heart for sinning against the lord and then the promise is that god will forgive and receive them graciously and bless them joel chapter 2 verse 12 Therefore also now, says the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. 13. Rend your heart, tear your heart apart, pierce your heart, and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. 
who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify it. Perhaps call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? That's the, that's the passage we're looking at today. The title is, Gathering for national repentance, intercession, and fasting. The, uh, the study is divided into three parts. Number one, repenting to receive God's forgiveness. Number two, renewal and restoration to God's favor. Number three, regarding the redeemed for guided fasting. Number one, repenting to receive God's forgiveness. As you study the Bible, many of us are students of the Bible. You will find out this. Throughout the scriptures, the one non-negotiable, indispensable condition of receiving forgiveness and acceptance with God and insisted upon by all inspired writers, that non-negotiable, that indispensable condition is repentance. Repentance is turning away from self, turning away from sin, and then turning to the Lord against whom the sinner has offended, and by whom alone the sinner can be pardoned and justified. I read it to you already. Look at it again. Joel chapter 2 verse 12. Therefore also now, don't delay, says the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. With fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. He tells them how they were to do it. What did he tell them? Rend your heart, not your garment. He wanted to prevent every form of hypocrisy or pretense. And that's why they were told to rend the heart, not the garment. As it is possible for men to draw near, with their leaves, while their hearts are far from him. So, is it possible to manifest external signs of grief without the necessary inward feeling of sorrow for sin and genuine repentance? And that's why he told them, rent your heart, not your garment. Let the repentance be genuine. The question is, how do we have Heart sorrow for sin. Number one, we stop rationalizing. Two, we stop justifying our actions before men. I didn't mean bad. I didn't mean to do evil. I did it in the innocency of my hand. I have done my best. Stop rationalizing. Don't justify your action. If God says it's bad, it's bad. And then we seek not the praise of men. We look unto the Lord alone. Men may praise you. Men may say, that's right. That's all right. But in the sight of God, if God says something is wrong, then it is wrong. Then you think of your sins as direct offense against a loving God who cares so much for your soul. And you consider the pain and the sorrow in the heart of Christ because of your sin. It's as you meditate much, much on what your sin is doing to dishonor God. What your sin is doing to pierce the heart of Christ and cause him great sorrow. And what your sin is going to do to your neighbors, causing them eventually not to repent, not to believe, and to suffer eternally. It's when you think about all that, you will realize that you need to turn to the Lord completely, rend your heart, 
not your garment. In fact, even some in the Bible, some people that were righteous, very, very righteous, when they look at the sins around them, the sins of the nation, they repented on behalf of the nation and they did it sincerely with burden in their heart. Their hearts were broken. Let me show you some examples. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, reading from verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned. You see what we are saying? Daniel didn't rationalize. The presidents and the other people did not see anything, did not find any fault with Daniel. And the king could not find any fault. And he served the Lord faithfully. But when it came to dealing with the sin of the nation, he identified with the nation, we have sinned in verse 5. We have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled. Even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments, neither have we akin unto thy servants the prophets, which speak in thy name to our kings and to our princes and to our fathers and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth to thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day. To the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespasses, because of their trespass, that they are trespassed against thee, O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our king, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. That's what Joel was calling the people to. And here, Daniel took his place at the feet of the Lord and he bent low and he didn't try to excuse himself even though he was a righteous man himself. He said to the Lord our God in verse 9 belong mercies and forgivenesses in the plural though we have rebelled against him neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which is set before us by his servants, the prophets. He kept on confessing. He kept on telling the Lord that uh, the nation had sinned. Do you see, uh, there's no self-justification here. There is no self-righteousness here. There is no superficial repentance here. There is no glossing over matters here. There is no excusing of self here. In verse 11, ye, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. He didn't put the blame of Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, he's a wicked king that is bringing all this on us. It's so and so, it's such and such. He said, this is just because of our sin. Repentance before the Lord. In verse 12, and he has confirmed his words. Which is speak against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven has not for under the whole heaven has not been done as has been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses. All this evil is come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God. Or our careless or nonchalant. We didn't care. We didn't even pray about it. That we might turn from our iniquities. And understand the truth. Therefore as the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us 
For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. Now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and has gotten thee renowned, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Can you count how many times he's been repeating that? We have rebelled, we have disobeyed, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O oh Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from the city Jerusalem, from thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for our iniquities, the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, Lord our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations. And the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplication before thee for our righteousness. Do we have any? But for thy, for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defy not. For thine own sake. O my God. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. You will see how he was repenting before the Lord. And that's what the Lord expects. Whenever announcement of judgment was brought by the prophet of God, like Joel brought it, uh, the announcement of the judgment is to tell the people, move the people, lead the people, drive the people to their knees so that they will pray in genuine repentance before the Lord. And of course, there are people that uh, they are slow to repent. And that's why Jeremiah in chapter 3, Jeremiah chapter 3, Verse 10, it says, Yea, and yet for this a treacherous sister Judah has not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, hypocritically, pretending, says the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel has justified herself more than treacherous Judah. That's one thing that prevents repentance. When we justify ourselves, when we justify our actions, when we give excuses for the things that the Lord says not to do, and we justify them, give reasons why we do them, why we must do them, why we must continue to do them. But sliding Israel has justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim, verse 12, these words toward the north and say return that backsliding Israel says the Lord and I will cause mine anger I will not cause my anger to fall upon you for I am merciful says the Lord and I will not keep anger forever only acknowledge thine iniquity that's all that's all be sincere be faithful and come to the Lord only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree and, ye, and that ye have not obeyed my voice says the Lord and then he still, he still told them again turn, turn backsliding, backsliding children says the Lord in Zechariah chapter 1. And whenever the Lord corrects us, rebukes us, chastises us, disciplines us, and that's what he expects. He doesn't expect us to say, it doesn't matter. I don't feel the rebuke. I don't feel the correction. It's nothing to me. The thing that even, doesn't even scratch my body. No, it shouldn't be like that. The Lord is expecting that will turn to the Lord and will repent genuinely. In Zechariah chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3, Therefore, say thou 
unto them. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, says the Lord of hosts. It says, you turn, then I will turn. You know, you know how we, how we try to strike a bargain with God. Oh God, do this for me, then I'll repent. God says, who are you? Creature, human being, dust and ashes, telling the Lord to turn first before you turn. The Lord said, turn unto me. And then he says, then I will turn unto you, says the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And he returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways, according to our doing so, as he dealt with us. The thing that the Bible is emphasizing over and over is that the Lord delights in the repentance of those who have trespassed against his word one way or the other. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel 18. Versace, therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. And immediately, this is a wonderful God. This is a loving God. This is a merciful God. He just told them now, Israel, I'm going to judge you. But again, he's saying that so that the people will repent. That's why immediately he says, repent. And turn yourselves from some of your transgressions. I said, some of your transgressions? No. Passion repentance is not enough. Repent and turn yourselves. You don't say everything. You know some, some so-called church goers? They say, it's the devil. It's the devil. If they go against the commandment of God, they shift the blame, they shift the responsibility on the devil. Oh, it's a spiritual problem. It's the devil. It's an evil spirit. It's Satan. Turn yourselves. God didn't say it was Satan. Oh yes, Satan causes temptation, but you're a free moral agent, and you're free before the Lord to choose to do what you want to do. He didn't tell Satan to repent on their behalf. Demons to repent on their behalf. He didn't tell them you're sinning against the Lord. It's the devil. It's evil spirit. It's spiritual conflict. Uh, the evil spirit doesn't like uh, Israel. Doesn't like Judah. It's a spiritual warfare. It's the evil spirit. Doing, it's you. Repent. Turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and leave ye. Actually, Jeremiah even assured the people, he said, Whatever the Lord has done, he assured the people, he told them, the Lord has not said, everything is final, I'm going to bring judgment on Judah, it's irrevocable, there's nothing else you can do. All the Lord is waiting for is repentance, if you repent in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 7, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to pluck it off and to pull it down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom 
I have pronounced. Turn from their evil. I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Repentance is what the Lord is looking for. And even if he has brought chastisement or judgment, and he has even brought prophecy that he'll pull down, he'll destroy. If that nation, if that group of people, if that individual will turn and repent with all their heart, sincerely and genuinely, the Lord says he will repent of the evil he thought he'll do to them. This repentance is it limited to the Old Testament? No. New Testament too. In fact, Jesus told the people, and Jesus is the most loving person, of course. Personification of love. But in love, he spoke about repentance. In Luke chapter 13, Luke 13, verse 1, there were present at that season some that told him, of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, Jesus has said unto them, Suppose ye that those Galileans were seen as above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, this is Jesus, this is our Lord, this is the Prince of Peace, this is the lover of our soul. This is the one that has the greatest love. This is a merciful Lord. You talk about mercy. You talk about love. You talk about grace. You talk about loving kindness. Here is Jesus. I tell you nay. But except ye repent, ye shall not likewise perish. Repentance is the word of the Lord. And then in verse 4, or those 18 upon whom the tower of Shiloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all the men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall not likewise perish. Many people don't know the Bible again. If a preacher says that today, they say, you see that the pastor is cursing us. We came to church for blessing. He laid a curse on us. Jesus, who is the very foundation of all blessing coming to us. He said, if we don't repent, we will perish. It's not a curse. It's the law of sowing and reaping. That what we sow, that we reap. That's why it's saying, uproot what you sow. If you don't want it to bring forth fruit, how do you approach that thing? By repenting. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. Acts 17, 30. And in times of this ignorance, God went out. But now, commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. So we see clearly from the word of God that if we are to receive the forgiveness of the Lord, then we need to repent. If we repent, he forgives us, but that leads us to not just forgiveness, to favor and fellowship. Point number two, renewal and restoration to God's favor. In Joel again, Joel chapter 2. After he had told them that what the Lord wanted was that they would repent. He tells them at the latter part of verse 13. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. He says, if you will just repent, he's gracious. That's on the basis of repentance. He's merciful. That's on the basis of repentance. You know, sometimes some of us adults, we, we behave like little children. Little, little children that don't understand. Their father may be correcting them about something. 
And a father is saying, my boy, change. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And if you change, if you repent, daddy says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And these children, they keep on doing exactly the same thing. Then, at school, they draw a, they draw a particular picture. And as they draw that picture, they bring the picture home. They're trying to tell daddy. And what did they draw sunshine? And they draw that sunshine smiling on the earth. And under each, they did it in the art section. They write, God is merciful. And then when they get back home, they display it on the table. Where daddy will see it. You know what they're trying to say? A little child, you don't understand. They say, Daddy, you are hard. And you say you are a Christian. See what we did in the art class. God is merciful. In their ignorance, they think that the mercy of God just forgets if you're stealing, if you're committing adultery, if you're living in sin, if you're living in rebellion. And that's why they demonstrate that to their father at home and put the artwork on the table. God is merciful. And some adults behave like that. Instead of repenting so that the favor of God, so that the mercy of God and the grace of God will be bestowed on them. They keep on in that same sin that God says Submit yourselves, humble yourselves, turn, repent, and on the basis of that repentance, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Then he says, who knoweth he if he will turn and repent and leave the blessing behind him? Even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. So uh, the Lord is telling us if we want renewal and restoration to the favor of God and into fellowship with God, there must be repentance. On that basis uh, of uh, repentance, there will be reconciliation and there will be restoration to, of the blessings of God into our lives. In Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiven iniquity and transgression and sin, that you, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Read everything. Long suffering, yes. Abundance in goodness, yes. Gracious, yes. Merciful, yes. But by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. The Lord forgives, but He wants repentance. In Psalm 145, Psalm 145, Psalm 145, verse 8 and verse 9. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies over all his works. Just repent and the favor of God is available. The mercy of God is ready at hand in Micah chapter 7 Micah chapter 7 verse 18 who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy he will turn again he will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities 
and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Yes, he will do that so that he will not remember it again when we repent. In Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. It says, you are the one delaying the forgiveness. Forgiveness is ready of the Lord. You are the one delaying your fellowship with God. The favor of God upon your life. The joy of salvation in your life. You are the one delaying the goodness of the Lord in your life. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And then when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. While we're in our sins, we're sort of living in the wilderness. But it is when we repent, refreshing like dew from heaven will come upon us. In verse 26, unto you post, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. And what's the major blessing? In turning away every one of you from his iniquity. And that's what God wants to do. There is hope of reconciliation and renewal, as well as restoration to divine favor and to the blessings of the Lord. At what time? When we repent and turn to God. When a sinner fully repents, wholeheartedly turns to God, he can trust God that he can receive now the forgiveness and many undeserved blessings. We have assurance from God's word. And we know that God cannot lie. That the penitent believing sinner will be granted pardon and the benefit of all spiritual blessings. In a Joel, the picture that Joel is giving us, if you look at that very well, it is a kind of picture. It pictures God as a king who had been offended by his subjects, who comes from his palace at the head of an army to punish the offenders. But as he came, the subjects, the people, they met him with the language of submission and supplication. Then his wrath is averted. And instead of punishing, he shows mercy. And he returns to his palace, leaving behind him some gifts and some blessings as tokens of favor and forgiveness. See the way Joel says it. Joel chapter 2. It says in verse 13, Rend your heart not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, leaving a blessing behind him? What kind of blessing? Abundance. And then you'll be able to offer the meat offering and the drink offering unto the Lord your God. Uh, Jeremiah uh, spoke to the people and Jeremiah was concerned. And Jeremiah had a reason to be concerned because uh, those people that, in fact, there were some people that even specially came to Jeremiah and they said, Jeremiah, you know what? We're expecting the word of the Lord. And please, please, teach us, teach us. We want that word. And they pleaded with him, Jeremiah, you go to the Lord and get from the mouth of the Lord what he wants to tell us. Before you even go, before you come back, we're promising we're going to obey. Look at Jeremiah chapter 42. Jeremiah chapter 42. Verse 1. Then all the captains of the forces, Johanan, the son of Kerea, and Jezaniah, the son of Oshiah, and all the people from the least even to the greatest came near and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee as supplication be accepted before thee and pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant. For we are left but a few of many as thine eyes do behold us, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk. And a thing that we may do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. 
behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not according, even according to all things, for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee that it may be well with us. When we obey the voice of the Lord our God. You see that? And these people, they knew that the basis of blessing is when we hear the word of God and we obey. And therefore they came to Jeremiah and they said, Jeremiah, we know the word of the Lord is with you. Go to the Lord. Bring the word unto us. Whether it's good, whether it's evil, it comforts, it cuts, we're going to obey. And it came to pass after 10 days in verse 7, that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. Then called he Johanan, the son of Kiriah, and all the captains of the forces, which were with him, and all the people from the least even to the greatest, and said unto them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, unto whom you sent me to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, then I will build you up and not pull you down, and I will plant you and not pluck you up, for I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, says the Lord. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his son. And I will show mercies unto you. That he may have mercy upon you and cause you to return to your land. He told them, don't run away. Don't go to other places. Just stay where you are and the blessing will come. And I'll show mercy unto you. Well, you sent me to the Lord to bring the word to you. I've given it to you. What are you going to do now? Chapter 43 verse 1. It came to pass. When Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then Azariah the son of Hoshiah, and Johanan the son of Kerea, and all the proud men, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God has not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. But seven, so they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Thus came they even to Tapanahi. Uh, can you see here, these people said, Jeremiah, we're ready now. Just to hear the word of God. Go and ask the Lord. Don't keep anything back from us. Good or evil, come back and tell us. We're ready now to obey. And then when he gave them the word, they didn't do it. And in Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 12 rather. Jeremiah chapter 12. Reading from verse 15. Jeremiah 12, 15. And it shall come to pass. After that, I have plucked them out, I will return. And have compassion on them. I will bring them again, every man to his heritage, every man to his land. And it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name, the Lord live it. As they taught my people to swear by Baal. Then shall they be built in the midst of my people. Verse 17. But if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. If they will not obey. You will see all the prophets emphasizing the same thing. 
that what the Lord is looking for is repentance. And when there's genuine repentance, then there will be forgiveness. We'll come back to Joel. We're now in point number three. Point number three is regarding the redeemed for guided fasting. And what do we say regarding? You know that when we start a watch with those letters R-E, it means it was done before, do it again. You gather them before, gather them again, regather them. Why are we talking of regarding? Joel chapter 1, verse 14. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. But they had not done it. So the Lord in the next chapter now called upon them again in verse 15 of chapter 2. Regather them. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify it fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even those that still suck. Let the bridegroom go forth out of a chamber and the bride out of a closet. Even those who have gotten married, just gotten married, the bride and the bridegroom. There's no honeymoon time now. Come on. Come out here. It's a serious matter. The people of God, the people of Judah, they're going through this devastation, destruction, and desolation coming upon them. These, if uh, the devastation comes and the army, the, the locals, if they sweep across the land, uh, that thing will wake you up from your bed of ease. Come out now, let us fast and pray. Everyone. And then it says in verse 17, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. It's not hypocritical weeping. It's not religious weeping. Sincere. Broken heart. Because of the fury of the Lord upon his people. And then it says, let them say, spare thy people. It's even teaching them how to pray. What to say to the Lord. Spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to reproach. That the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? As in the previous chapter, here is another call to supplication, intercession, and fasting. The priests and all the people, young and old, were called to earnestly seek God for restoration to covenant relationship in seasons of national disaster. In seasons of church problem, conflict. In seasons when we have not seen repentance in the church of the living God. Righteousness in the church of the living God. In seasons when a holiness church demonstrates something contrary to holiness. All through. In seasons when... The grace of God that has brought salvation appearing unto all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. And in that, such a church, when we have not seen that overflowing grace of God to make us live a righteous life, a humble life, a holy life, an upright life. That's the time when the priests and the ministers and the leaders and the workers and the whole church will rise up, make supplication unto the Lord. In seasons when the joy of the Lord dries up. In seasons when the righteousness we used to enjoy, the holiness we, we used to enjoy, that we embraced. In seasons when that holiness is trampled upon by children and adults, their parents and their children. And holiness is no more the central thing at such a time when God looks upon Judah and he looks upon his church, the Israel of God today. And he cannot see everybody desiring to please him. 
everybody desiring to walk humbly with their God at such a time? The spiritual people and those who desire the progress of the church of the living God will fall upon their faces. No hypocrisy. No hypocritical crying. No crying with jesting in the church. You seem crying to jest. But crying with all their heart. Saying, oh God, spare your people. In seasons when... The followers of the Prince of Peace are having conflict. The followers of the Prince of Peace do not have the peace of God reigning in their midst. We shouldn't cover the soul with just gauze or plaster. Open it up. That soul. Wash it. We know the soul that is there. Where peace ought to reign, where righteousness ought to reign, where obedience ought to be the center, where holiness ought to be lifted up, we see rebellion, we see sin, we see incorrigible attitude in seasons when instead of holiness, it's sin. Instead of righteousness, it's iniquity. That's the time that Joel is talking about. We shouldn't just be in church. This is not a nominal church. We should bow before the Lord. And if we have done all this is that we have read from chapter 1. What? This is study 5. Study 5. If since Joel has been talking to us from study one, we had done what the Lord said, the goodness of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord, the revival and the refreshing of the Lord, and all the, all the blessings, inheritance, heritage of heaven would have been showered upon us. That's why Joel was calling them again. And he's saying, wake up everyone. Sound a trumpet in Zion. Call a solemn assembly. Declare a fast. Get everybody together. Don't let even the children, toddlers, that are still sucking, don't let them even be excused. Everyone. That's not fanaticism. That's not being overzealous. That's knowing what the problem is and knowing the only thing that will bring solution. And it wasn't only Joel. That's what you'll find. Every Every faithful, sincere minister of God telling the people since the foundation of time. In 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7. Reading from verse 3. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaros from among you. And prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Baalim and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. Wonderful. He just told them once and he just obeyed. Old Testament. Once and he just obeyed. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mispay, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And he gathered together to Mispay, and drew near, and poured, and uh, drew water, and poured it before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged, counseled the children of Israel in Mispay. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to mispay, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. But since they had done what they ought to do, look at verse 9. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering 
holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel. And the Lord heard it. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them. And it was smitten before Israel. It's repentance the Lord is looking for. It's after that repentance, then His favor, His mercy, His miracle, His power will be manifested on our behalf. A wonderful were those days when we came for a Bible study and we just studied the Bible. No distraction. It was such a joy to teach, such a joy to learn. Nobody in any place trying to show any action. That's enough. That's enough. It, wonderful were those days. We just came to church. Joy. Superlative joy. No rebuke. Just fellowship. Wonderful were those days when the joy of the Lord just saturated our church. But how is it that some individuals came in and they, they take that joy away and the rest of us we just open our eyes looking at people around us beside us and we cannot tell them please this is our church are you a member of our church here we're united don't bring this unity. I shouldn't even be saying that from the pulpit. The people of God, if you are praying for the church, if you are fasting for the church, if you have repented, when you see anything anywhere, that you know that hey, this is not all right, before I see it, you are the one there to say, this is a peaceful place, a joyful place, a place where the grace of God is abundant, and you are the one to hold that person by the hand, take him to the back there, lecture him, kneel down and pray with him to repent, and then you come back. If we did that in a week, in a month, the joy of the Lord will overshadow this place again. And it will happen. I said it will happen. In Ezra chapter 10, Ezra chapter 10, I'm reading to you there from verse 6. Then Ezra rose up before the house of God and went into the chamber of Johanan, son of Eliashib. When he came, here we're told, he came thither. He did eat no bread, nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgressions of them that had been carried away. Mourned. Unhappy. And the Lord still wants us to show that attitude. If you love the church, how can you be? You are living in a house. The roof is coming down. Doesn't concern you. The windows are broken. Doesn't concern you. The door is pulled down. Doesn't concern you. And all kinds of wild animals are entering into the house where you are sleeping. Doesn't concern you. Here, you are in the church, in the house of God. This is your church. And you see all this is coming in. Doesn't concern you or to concern you. It concerned Daniel. It concerned Joel. It concerned Micah. It concerned Paul. It ought to concern you. In Psalm 34, Psalm 34, verse 17 and verse 18, the righteous cry, this is sincere, not hypocritical, the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. If we laugh about it, jest about it, joke about it, the deliverance will be far away. But when the righteous become concerned, then it says in verse 18, The Lord is near unto them 
that of a broken heart. It's not a laughing matter. Broken heart. When God is dishonored. When holiness is relegated to the background. When disobedience replaces obedience. When there is conflict unresolved. That's not a laughing matter. Broken heart. It says, the Lord is near unto them that of a broken heart and he saves them delivers them rescues them that of a contrite spirit Psalm 51 Psalm 51 verse 17 the sacrifices of the Lord a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart O God thou wilt not despise. I have faithfully declared to you once again today the word of the Lord. I have to do it in faithfulness to the Lord. Encouraged or not encouraged, I still have to do it. And I hope what we're looking for. The righteousness. The holiness. The preservation of purity in the church of the living God. I hope we will see it. I said, I hope we'll see it. Come back to Joel. Therefore, also now, says the Lord, turn ye, even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, rend your heart, and not your garment, turn unto the Lord your God. If you do, it's gracious and merciful. Rise up and let us pray. If you are a friend, you will listen. Open your mouth and pray. If you are a friend of this church, you will help us. Everybody stand up. That's what I'm still talking about. Everybody stand up. If you are a friend of the church, you will obey. If you have sincere interest in a Bible study, and you told me to teach you, hear it from the Lord and declare it to us. If you meant it, then you will obey. Pastor, we want to listen, teach us. If you mean that, then you will obey. We love you, Pastor. We love you, Pastor. Show it by the life you live by your response to the word of God. We're praying for you, Pastor. We're praying for you, Pastor. God will give you boldness to keep on declaring the word of God unto us. If you mean it, I declare it to you. Show it by obeying the word of God. Pastor, we appreciate you so much. We appreciate you so much. You don't know how much the people appreciate you. Show it by obeying the word of God. We're praying for you. Our families pray for you. We members of the choir, we prayed for you specially. Uh, not talk of mouth. Show it by obeying the word of God. We love the church. Thank God for the doctrine. Thank God for the teaching. Thank God for his faithfulness. I'm happy to belong to a church like this. Show it. 
by obeying that word. Don't just talk. Don't just talk. Obey. Show it. Pastor, we accept correction. Don't stop. Keep on telling us. We just enjoy correction. I don't think we don't like your rebuke. We like the rebuke. We like the correction. We like everything. Then show it. By obeying all that we have said. Those little, little things were mentioned. Obey. If you say you enjoy the correction, let us see it. It says, turn to the Lord. unto the Lord with all your heart rend your heart and not your garment turn to him with all your heart and then the blessing of the Lord will be upon you he will turn he is merciful he is slow to anger and he will leave the blessing behind He'll call you into fellowship and into favor. Whom the Lord loves, he chastises, repent, turn you therefore, and repent. And let the blessing of God flow into your life.